we've had yelling. You can say, you know, we're not going to get a recession because I'm going to spend like, a, I'm going to issue debt like a monkey. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's literally said that. And mm -hmm. so, and we're in front of an election year. Mm -hmm. Do you think the Biden administration is once a recession? No way. And mm -hmm. ultimately, Yellen works for the Biden administration. She is a cabinet member. So she's definitely going to, you know, keep that going. And no member in Congress is going to vote against spending. Yeah, they may talk about it because it's going to turning points. Oh, my God. You know, we're going to shut down the government. It's not going to happen. They're going to they're all going to spend like monkeys because everybody wants to get reelected. Re Nobody wants a recession in front of them. Welcome to the Rose Show podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. I have the honor of being here with Tracy Shukart. She is founder and CEO and chief market strategist for Hill Tower Resource Advisors, LLC. She has a wealth of information and knowledge in energy, commodities, and geopolitics. So how are you doing today, Tracy? Oh my God. It's so we have been trying to plan this for forever. So present it's very it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm so glad that we were able to finally connect. So am I. You are a very busy woman and you are hard to track down. So I'm so happy to have you here finally. And we're gonna make today a great show. So much to learn from you, Tracy. You are an amazing woman. And you have so much knowledge in geopolitics and energy markets and commodities. So I'm so excited to talk to you about that. You have a new collaboration that you're doing right now. And I want you to tell us about that with Andy Constant and Jimmy Jude. Yeah, absolutely. So I have a new collaboration uh, alongside of my own company, which is mostly geared towards the institutional investor. I have a new collaboration with um, Andy Constant, who is amazing, and Jimmy Jude, and offering a product for uh, retail investors, which I think is uh, a project I'm really excited about right now. And so uh, it's a good thing, I think. Absolutely. Retail needs to know the truth beyond the headlines. I have to say, in energy markets and commodities, there's so much misinformation. And the headlines are deceiving. So we need someone like you, Tracy. And what you do on Twitter is amazing. How you bring out the truth and what's really going on in these markets, which I have to say seem to be hidden from retail. So thank you so much for all you do. You know, Tracy, before we dive into the commodities and energy markets, I want you to just tell our audience your background and how you started with commodities and energy markets. Well, so I um I'm a graduate of USC with a dual major in political science and international relations. And so I was always very interested in um the Middle East and the intersection of the commodities markets with the regular markets. Now I do have to admit to your viewers, this is my second um profession because I was in California at the time and I thought after college it would be interesting to get into the entertainment industry mm. and so um I had a few stints as an art director right. on, uh, a we couple didn't know that about you B B B B B minus minus films <laughs> <No>. <laughs> But, you know, I, um, I, it pays no money it's, and it's a lot of work. And so I decided kind of I was um, I was kind of uh, done with California at the time and done with not being paid at all. <laughs> and so I picked up my bags and decided to move to uh, Chicago where I didn't know anybody and get into the commodities field, which I had always been interested in. Um, and I picked up and moved and, um, got an apartment and then went to the board of trade and started knocking on doors <laughs> to get a job. And literally my first job was at a boiler room brokerage calling 400 people a day saying, can you give me some money to trade options on futures? <laughs> it was crazy. It was crazy. Um, but that was back in the day, back in the day, right? You know, we're talking about like your commission on a round turn was 
it's $75. <laughs> now it's pennies. <laughs> so, um, so that's how I got started really and kind of worked my way up from there. Crazy. Wow. That's so cool. I didn't know that about you being in Hollywood and all that. Um, so thank you for that. Now, you know, I want to get started with just today's news, PCE. You know, we see and everyone's cheering year over year. We're down, um, but it's still rising month over month. Right. So I'd like to know your thought. And we had CPI, you know, we, we know there's a disinflation versus deflation. We don't have deflation. Um, we may have it slowing down, but there's still inflation. It's sticky in pockets. What are your thoughts with inflation? And I know you have some tweets, some great tweets that you talk about. Do you think re inflation may reaccelerate? Absolutely. I do think it, inflation will reaccelerate and we're already starting to see that in January PCI and I think this trend will continue I think we had this beat I think that it's easy for the Fed to say we have inflation beat right because we were at nine percent but it's always that last mile mm -hmm. that is the hardest to get over right and so I think the Fed, again, and I've been saying this for over a year, is going to either have to decide we're going to accept 3 to 4%, over 2% as our target, or it's going to be an uphill battle. And that's kind of where we're stuck right now. We're at that 3.4%. We're stuck there. And it's that last mile, it's going to be the hardest hurdle for the Fed to get over. And in addition, we have all these other geopolitical issues going on, particularly with the Red Sea and um, additional days with uh, adding on to costs for um, transit to the U.S., to Asia, to Europe in particular. Europe's actually feeling this more than we are right now, but it's only because it's closer and we can get into that further. But um, so I think this last mile for the Fed is going to be very difficult for them to overcome as far as getting to their 2% rate that they so want this to be at. Well said. I agree with you. You know, inflation is cumulative. And I like to use the analogy of inflation is like weight, you know, gaining weight. You know, if I'm gaining less weight this year than last year, I'm still gaining weight. So it's the last few pounds when you lose weight that it seemed to be the hardest. So it's just like you said, with inflation, these sticky last uh, basis points here, we're in the threes and high twos might be a little harder to bring back down. Um, you know, you mentioned the Red Sea. And I know you have some excellent tweets that you talk about how those issues can have ramifications, not only in Europe, but also in the US with supply chains and, and many other issues. And that can also cause inflation to trickle back up. Um, so could you please tell us about what is going on with the Red Sea? The You had a great tweet today, the Houthis, they will introduce military surprises in their Red Sea operations. Um, that was the group's leader said that. Could you tell us what's going on over there? All right. And so we have a, a multifold problem in the Red Sea right now. Obviously, with the onslaught of the Israel uh, Palestine issue, this is what's kind of sparked this conflict in the Red Sea because the Houthis. Um, or in support of Gaza and have said that as long as Gaza is being attacked or a point of attack from Israel, they're going to basically disrupt the Red, the Red Sea transit. And that was their way of expressing their uh, opposition to what's happening there. Whether that's right or wrong, I'm trying to word this carefully because I don't want this to be. I want the, I want you to understand that this is this is not what I'm saying. This is what the who mm -hmm. are saying. You're the messenger. You're not the one saying it. Yeah. All right. And so, um, and so what this group has been able to incredibly happen is this small 
group in Yemen has been able to literally disrupt global trade. And now this is going to be a problem because this gives credibility to these factions saying, oh my God, this is all we have to do dis to disrupt global trade. I mean, this is a problem. And this is why we have seen the United States and the West the the rest of the EU kind of respond to this. The problem is when the US tried to form a coalition to respond against this threat, they didn't get the support from the EU that they wanted. And that escalated the problems within the Red Sea. And so initially what we saw is container ships being threatened. Mm -hmm. So initially we saw container ships, that's bulk carriers, et cetera, being attacked. And we didn't really see uh, product or oil tankers being attacked because it, you know you have to realize there's a lot of uh, factions in that this an area that there's a lot of oil transport there and uh, of friendly countries to the Yemenis, so they say. Um, the difference now is, and that's why, you know, a lot of people ask, well, why aren't we seeing an uptick in oil? Why, you know, why is mm -hmm. this affecting container rates and it's not affecting tanker rates? And so, but that all changed about a month ago. And uh, tankers were product tankers and oil tankers were starting to be a, attacked. And so since then, now we have seen elevated oil prices and thus elevated tanker prices because now they're just out for whatever they can get their hands on. And, and basically, they outright said, we're focusing on, you know, U.S. and U.K., ships we don't care what they are if you, you know if you're owned by the us uk we're going after you and so kind of that's where we are as far as if, if we want to talk about what's happening in the red sea right now there's been a lot of accidents too i mean they actually attacked a russian tanker which by accident <laughs> it's mm -hmm. it's kind of a mess out there and you have to know this is a rogue a, a, a rogue group that's out to and they have nothing to lose literally yemen's the most poorest is one of the most poorest countries on the planet they've been attacked they've been at war for over a decade <laughs> and so these people are, they have nothing to lose and so they're just going for it and so it's a very contentious situation i would have to say in the red sea right now and to, and to talk about it politically you have to look at both sides of the situation to address it properly. Well said. Thank you so much for that. Very sad for the people over there. Um, yeah. And you have to always look at both sides. I agree with you. Um, well said with that. Thank you so much, Tracy. Now, I know you had a lot of tweets about pirates, people see, like you just said, seizing tankers. What are your thoughts regarding the energy markets? Oil, and um, LNG, natural gas, all of that, its effects on the energy markets. Are you seeing potential investment opportunities because of what may go on in the next six to 12 months in that area? I think that, I think that, I think this affects the tanker market more than anything if we're talking about specifically red mm -hmm. sea issues, right? I think you can look at the tanker market and look at it, I mean, uh, daily rates and things of that nature of course these companies are going to make a lot more money because it's a lot more expensive mm -hmm. move things around the cape of africa and instead of you know through the red sea in addition you have insurance companies obviously charging you a lot more money <laughs> in addition you also have surcharges um in the industry because you might be attacked and so we're going to charge you more <laughs> so all of this coming to fruition so i think this is benefiting the tanker market in particular mm -hmm. 
in addition with the tanker market, what we have a problem is, is that we have a lack of tankers carrying products or oil products. And this has been a concern for the industry for a long time. And now that you have extended trips around the Cape and also problems in the Panama Canal, this makes trips longer. This makes shortages of tankers more prevalent because now it's taking, you know, I want to ship something from here to here. I can ship it from here to here in 10 days, say, for example, offload, pick up new product and move elsewhere. Now I'm adding 10 days onto that journey, right? Or 10 days under, there's 45 days in the Panama Canal on a wait right now. And so this is just uh, upending the cycle, the shipping cycle. And so it's adding to, it's, it's exacerbating problems in how global oil flows transit the globe, essentially. Mm, makes sense there. Thank you so much for that. Um, okay, so the tankers um, will likely benefit. Um, I know recently there was a big surge in like Zim and, you know, Starbolt, you know, the shipping companies and on the bulk shipping. Um, are you, um, are there any equities or any stocks or any particular sector that you are bullish on as a result of this? I'm bullish on, I, I am bullish on tankers, <laughs> uh, oil tankers. Not oil tankers. Not, I think the uh, container market has kind of played itself out. I think it, you had that initial surge. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Zim, which everybody loves in the container market because it's mm -hmm. somehow this benchmark for how the entire industry is going to go. But um, I think we've already seen that kind of surge. If you look at um, Fredo's or uh, um, Drury prices, you know, we have seen those bulk container market prices sort of come down about 5% from their highs at this point. But as far as the paper rates, we I think we have yet to see the height of that because I think it, we're looking at like a two-month lag on that yes. situation. Yeah, the data lags. Okay, great. We'll definitely be checking that out. Now, let's go into the energy now, global oil demand is rising. Energy demand is rising. So when you look at the energy market and you look at the whole with the geopolitical overlay, OPEX plus all the, you know, they would talk all these talk of cuts and all this kind of stuff. What are your thoughts with oil market going into this year, 2024 and forward? What are you bullish on and how are you looking at it and playing it? Well, I think I am bullish on the energy market because I think that we all know that the West has, you know, these green energy plans, particularly Europe, that they just don't want to, you know, give up yet, which means that we've had um we've had a capex problem since 2016 and that's not only in the oil markets we're seeing this in the mining markets as well which is going to be a problem if you want to uh, produce more wind turbines and solar panels and ev batteries mm -hmm. and evs and so you know we've had a huge capex problem i think this will continue i think that oil demand will continue but I think it's important really for energy people to consider is that I think China's no longer going to be the front and foremost of demand. Everybody looks at, and ironically, China's oil demand last year was the highest it's ever been in ever mm -hmm. <laughs> at all time high. So, but I think that as far as commodities, I want to say it broadly are concerned, I think China is no longer going to be in that forefront model that everybody looks at. Like, is China buying? Okay, we're bullish. <laughs> you know, <laughs> is China not buying? Okay, we're bearish. I think that market is pretty much, I think the market's play, pretty much not played out, but I think we're going to be set to see lower GDP numbers from them, lower growth numbers from them for a variety of reasons. And I think what investors really need to be looking at going forward is where is demand coming from 
elsewhere outside of China because it is growing up. I think we're going to see huge demand out of India. I think we're going to see huge demand out of Africa. And I think what investors are missing right now are these opportunities. Excellent points there. There was a recent, I think it was a few months ago, article about India being the next big growth story and looking at investments over there. And I think it's important that we look at global macro and emerging markets uh, for investment opportunities. And I agree with you, India seems to have be poised for that and Africa as well. Um, but yeah, I think that the whole discussion, the reopening of China proved to be very disappointing. And, you know, um, we're geoeconomic competitors, but you know, the whole story of, you know, China being the leading GDP and taking on the U.S., I think that was another sideshow there and, and story. So I agree with you on that and makes total sense there um, with us looking elsewhere for where the demand is coming from. Um, what about natural gas? And I, I have to bring it up because it's just been on a steady decline. And it seems to be that there's just an overabundance of supply. Is is that, I mean, we just came out of winter and we're seeing it's just going down constantly. No, um, yeah. There are, in the United States, there's definitely an oversupply. We already know that. That's why we're building out these LNG facilities so that we can export it overseas. You know, and we just became the largest, or 2023, the United States just became the largest uh, LNG exporter in the world. Now, whether that holds true or not because of what Qatar is doing is another story. But that said, that's a, a huge feat for the United States that literally most of that was um, contained. I mean, we've had negative nat natural gas prices before <laughs> so, in the US. And so it's a huge feat that we're now uh, moving natural gas out of the country and becoming a, an export nation and the largest export nation. Um, I think the problem with, you know, what we have seen with the Biden administration recently saying we're going to halt export licenses mm -hmm. did not do any favors, obviously, for the sentiment in the market. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, we saw natural gas prices after that hit the lows. And, uh, but, you know, I think that, uh, I think it's mostly for for voters, as I digress, I think it's mostly for voters. I think that position will change. There's too much money involved. There's too many lobbyist groups involved. We, we have to look at this from like a realistic standpoint politically as well. And so I think it's nice and all to say we're going to halt export licenses because our people on, you know, our young voters on uh, TikTok want to see this. But I, I, I don't foresee that actually holding. But it did hurt, or obviously hurt uh, natural gas sentiment in the U.S. and thus natural gas prices, which we saw this reflected also in um, earnings last week. Our earnings over the last couple of weeks when we had big, big companies like um, Chenier and Equitrans and uh, Comstock and, and Terra Resources all said, you know, we're cutting produ production. It's just, I mean, they say low, low, low prices are the cure for low prices, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely are. Um, definitely uh, makes sense to cut production. Um, so you're um, not making money. <laughs> nope. Nope. That's definitely a, a good reason to, to cut production. Um, you know, renewables. I know you tweet a lot about how, you know, and I read also about how Europe want to move more towards green energy, especially Germany. Uh, I know recently you had a great tweet about Germany, they are refusing nuclear energy, but they, they're open to nuclear bombs. Um, very strange decision-making there. Um, now we have the Red Sea affects Europe most of all. And now they're still trying to phase out and go to green energy, which we know isn't gonna cure and solve their energy issues. Um, tell us more about that. Well, of course not. All right, so when you look at energy in general, and I, I'm going to talk about this for people that don't really understand what baseload power is and what intermittent power is. Mm -hmm. And so 
What you want is you want base load power. Your base load power is something that can supply you power all the time. That's natural gas, crude oil, coal, uh, and nuclear. That can consistently, all day long, provide you with power. Now, when we talk about intermittent power, we talk about wind and solar. Why? Why is it intermittent? Well, obviously, if the sun is not shining, like at night, it can't supply you power. And if the wind's not blowing, it can't supply you power. So you as a country, what you want is you want a base low power that consistently pull you through the day. If you want to add solar and wind on top of that, that's great. But you cannot have your whole system based on intermittent power. You need some sort of baseload power in those times where you can't get power from those other sources that don't consistently provide you power. And unfortunately, there's just not battery storage enough right now. The technology is not there to help you through this. And so the thing with the thing with Germany is mm -hmm. they not only cut their nuclear power, which is clean energy, very clean energy, um, but they increased their coal consumption because they wanted to get rid of nuclear. I mean, they, it's a whole backwards thinking. And, you know, I and this is not just me saying this. Everybody in the world is saying this. And yet they're still adamantly against something like nuclear, which they had great nuclear plants. In addition, ironically, they buy a lot of energy from France which is all powered by nuclear. So um, there's a lot of things going on in uh, in Europe right now that are uh, most people think that are, you know, kind of beyond belief. And unfortunately, that's hampering their manufacturing sector because what's happening is because of their energy policies, this is making energy prices almost unattainable for manufacturing and so we've seen manufacturing flee which is the powerhouse of of europe so when we talk about manufacturing everybody says oh you know the eu everybody looks to germany and so the problem is is that we've seen manufacturing leave to the united states <laughs> and to china and to because their energy prices are so unaffordable for manufacturing to stay there and so it's a self destruction <laughs> yeah <laughs> for better words. i was like trying to think of a better word for like self amalgamation but i was Let's just get to the point it's just right let's do it um so it's just self-destruction and this is what we're seeing in this is what we're seeing in, in, oh. in europe and it's just a horrible situation and it is all because we you know these green policies which you know you may or may not agree with, but, um, you know, we're literally witnessing in, in real time the complete collapse of a manufacturing powerhouse in fast forward. I mean, this is not, normally you see this in, you know, remember when we outsourced everything to China mm -hmm. 20 years ago and we saw manufacturing decline in the U.S., but it took, you know, 10 years to see that. We're seeing this in Germany in like three years. Fast forward. <laughs> it's crazy. Very sad. Germany is a manufacturing powerhouse. Um, it's unfortunate what's going on with there and these policies that they're implementing. Um, you know, I've noticed that, you know, the world is multi-players. We're all interconnected. And there's a lot of, re in the U.S., we have reshoring going on, a lot of protectionism. Um, what are your thoughts on all that? And is that contributing to inflation? Well, absolutely. And I think you're going to continue to see sort of reshoring, friendshoring, however you want to call that, mm -hmm. as well as protectionist uh, issues when we're talking about commodities in specific. And we've already seen a lot of countries, you know, if they would rather not export to lower prices domestically. We've seen this often in India. We actually just saw this in Russia. Russia is actually stopping uh, exports of um, gasoline because they need to bring down their prices at home. 
And believe it or not, yes, people are still buying Russian gas and oil and everything. Mm -hmm. But um, so I think this you're going to see a lot of protectionist issues come up. And we have seen that increasing over the last five years or so, I would say, particularly with critical minerals do, you know, that are uh, particularly of interest to uh, green projects. And I think we're going to see this more and more when it comes to food, in my opinion. Yeah. I agree with you. Absolutely. Food prices are elevated and uh, are not coming down. And I think we're going to definitely notice uh, probably, you know, I hate to think that it's going to get any higher, but, um, you know, it's unfortunate what's going on. And you mentioned Russia. Interesting. You know, sanctions don't work. Uh, I think they're just there for symbolism, but um, they don't work. And yeah, they're still buying from Russia. Um, you know, and that's just how it is. Um, you know, let's go to domestic. And let's talk about the US and the economics here, which also contribute to the inflation debt, fiscal spending, massive fiscal spending, to the point that it's bloating GDP, and potentially disguising the private sector hardship. So what are your thoughts about this unsustainable fiscal deficit spending that's going on right now? Well, you know, it's been a problem. It is a problem. And this is where we've had monetary policy putting up with fiscal policy, right? So you have the Fed trying to raise rates. Mm -hmm. They're not in alignment. Try to tighten. And you've had the Treasury, basically, and Treasury and the Congress basically mm -hmm. say, woohoo, let's go. Let's go spend. We're going to spend. And, you know, you've had... <clears throat> We've had Yellen even say, you know, we're not going to get a recession because I'm going to spend like a, I'm going to issue debt like a monkey. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, she's literally said that. Mm -hmm. And so, and we're in front of an election year. Mm -hmm. Do you think the Biden administration is once a recession? No way. And mm -hmm. ultimately, Yellen works for the Biden administration. She is a cabinet member. So she's definitely going to, you know, keep that going. And no member in Congress is going to vote against spending. Yeah, they may talk about it because it's going to turning points. Oh, my God. You know, we're going to shut down the government. It's not going to happen. They're going to they're all going to spend like monkeys because everybody wants to get reelected re and nobody wants a recession in front of that. And so this is a huge problem. This is a huge problem for the United States. And this is why our debt continues to go up. And I, I just don't see any reason for that to stop because nobody has an incentive to stop right now. I mean, we're debt junkies, right? We are. <laughs> Absolutely. Debt is a drug and they just keep spending to no end. And especially, like you said, election year, and it's like they're kicking the can down the road and you just keep spending and delaying this potential recession Many economists say it's baked in, and now they're saying maybe next year, 2025, we'll have to wait and see. We um, keep putting that off, right, though? Yeah, because it was supposed to be this year. <laughs> keep putting that off because of fiscal spending, right? We've had the yield curve inversion forever, which is, you know, who everybody's talked about, but yet we've, you know, put that off for three years now if it, because, because we have the fiscal spending literally kicking the can down the road. So mm -hmm. when... When do they stop? I don't know. When do they stop? You tell me. <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. I think they just continue <laughs> until I don't know. But, I know, right? Like <laughs> you tell me. Bro. So we're we're riding we're riding forward, and uh, I think we're continuing. So let's talk about the Fed and the pivot. Um, there's these all these rate cuts, and I know you and I have tweeted back and forth about higher for longer seems likely. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts? Do you think the market's expecting too much and you think they're going to be disappointed? Oh, I think there have been instances. When we were tweeting back and forth about that, I think at that time there was like seven rate cuts priced mm -hmm. into the market for 2024. You and I were like, what? <laughs> so, yeah. and, and, right? And now we're down to three. Mm -hmm. I still think higher for longer. I, mean, I think still think we caught. There was, there's no reason mm -hmm. to cut rates. So, you know, I think that's expectations of market because everybody likes the drug. <laughs> everybody likes the drug. And 
we're gonna have oh my god inflation's back down to three percent let's cut rates seven times it's not you know i just don't i don't see any uh impetus for the, the fed to really start cutting rates right now especially when we are starting to see core uh cpi rise again I, I, there's just you know i think this, they're gonna be very careful and let you know i mean I, powell's been very careful now when they did switch their narrative in december that's when markets went crazy when all of a sudden we had you know the the fed kind of switched their narrative they were tight 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 and then we had that kind of narrative switch in december do you remember mm -hmm. which was very strange and then the markets went hog wild and they've been hog wild since they have and so I don't care <laughs> i it's crazy and so um and so i think it's going to be hard for the fed to walk that back mm -hmm. uh talking about it what i think the market's going to be i think you know i think march is going to be very interesting because people still kind of expect to cut march I'm like, and so i think you know i think march and june meetings are going to be very very interesting to see how people really react to uh, the situation because I just don't see a cut. I just don't see a reason to cut. That's what we love about you. You're straightforward to the point and you're a smart woman. Um, well said. I couldn't say any better myself. That's uh, it's right. It doesn't make any sense why they would cut. You have inflation is still sticky in many pockets and potential reacceleration like you've clearly laid out. We have a labor market that's tight. And you know, although we go underneath the headlines- And the stock market at the all-time highs. Yes. What do we need to jack anymore? <laughs> GDP is high, it's up. We're not in like, you know, two negative quarters back to back like we had the other year. Um, you know, we have the fiscal spending keeps bloating it. And um, there's no reason. I mean, labor participation rate is lower than pre-pandemic. Uh, but, you know, and there's a it's a gig economy that we're in. But, you know, the numbers look good. You know, on paper, everything they looks do good. look good. Now, whether there are issues under the table doesn't really matter. The Fed's, mm -hmm. not, looking, exactly. Fed's not looking at that. They're looking at the headline numbers mm -hmm. and this is what they see. And so exactly. you, might, you and I might see something different underneath mm -hmm. the table, but it's not showing up in headline numbers right now and that's all the fed is looking at right now that matters right that's for their record that's all that's what they look at and so to me it seems that you know there's no reason for it like you said and the markets are running and they just don't care and and hey we 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 go with with how it goes you know and so um well said there thank you so much now i want to go into commodities because that is your forte and that is a specialized niche and we all want to learn from you. So what are your thoughts on, I know it's a broad basket. I mean, commodities <laughs> is like everything, right? So we talked about energy markets and oil. Please give us your thoughts about what you're looking at that you're bullish on. Let's talk about metals, agriculture, you know, all of that. Yeah, I think uh, right now, I, I think that, I think, I still love the copper market. Mm. You know, so bullish on the copper market, just because of the supply demand fundamental. And because of if you really want to reach these green goals, even if you got a third of the way to where you, the projections are right now, mm -hmm. um, you're going to need more copper than we've ever mined since the history of copper mining. Period. Wow. That's Copper. huge. Right? And so, I mean, literally, we're going to need more than ever that's ever in the history been dug out of the ground ever. <laughs> so, wow. You know, and, and we just don't have, in the fundamentals are, we just don't have the mining capacity. We don't have the, you know, we don't have enough mines. We don't have enough, you know, we, we just don't have enough. Like, Oh, wow. And how would you play that, the copper? Just Could you give us some examples of where we could look? You know, I think I would be looking at some, maybe some miners. Mm. I'm looking, be looking at straight copper price because straight copper price is very much sideways. And um, I would caution against st straight out futures because of how volatile mm -hmm. they are for most investors. And so um, and 
and because of margin requirements and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So I think I think minors, although you know you have to do your own research and find the minors that have great projects that are already permitted that are in uh, countries that are not political, geopolitical problem areas. Mm -hmm. So you know, be careful of. Uh, how you choose your minors, I'm not going to tell you how to choose your minor or which mm -hmm. minors to choose, but, you know, just be aware of, you know, there's a lot of copper mines in politically unstable countries. And so you just want to make sure, even if the numbers look good, you know, how politically stable is this country? Because a lot of these minors in general are in third world countries that are somewhat unstable, particularly when we're looking at uh, African nations. In addition, you know, I think I think the uranium market is still dynamite. Mm -hmm. I think that will continue. I think we have seen prices escalate, you know, are over a hundred bucks, well, just under a hundred bucks now after this recent pullback. But you know, I think this is a time we saw a lot of the major miners, CCJ, for et cetera, you know, did extremely yes. well last year, extremely well. But I think prices are actually at the point right now that junior miners can actually start jumping in this game. And so I would start looking at junior miners. Junior miners, one, that have already been permitted and that are just waiting for prices to, to get to where they can actually make money and have already drilled it and have proven products. So don't just jump on any junior miner. You want somebody that's already permitted and already drilled and then I would say I think they would do well and they would probably do better than I think than the majors. I think the majors will continue to do well. I think that's a great place to be. But I think if you're looking for, a, you know, I think we're going to see the year of the junior minors over the majors. But I think the majors will still do well. If that makes sense. It makes total sense. I love your thinking because. <laughs> Similar thinking for me, I, I when I was playing the gold and silver, I liked the junior miners. Um, to me, they just offered a lot of uh, great return for, for risk. Right. Uh, and then the junior miners in uranium, the U-R-N-J ETF, like that one. And there's a U-R-N-M, that's the miners. I did CCJ recently as well. And there's like so many... Uh, there's DNN. There's like a lot of smaller companies in the uranium. I'm also bullish uranium. Um, what do you think about the supply? I spoke with someone, um, an energy, another energy expert about uranium, and he was bullish on it, but he said that be careful of the supply side. There could be a lot of supply. Are you looking at it that way? Are you concerned about that? Uh, no. I mean, we had CCJ come out and say they were under production targets and they will continue mm -hmm. to be under production chart targets. And then we had Kazakhstan, which is the largest uranium producer in the world, also underperformed uh, production targets and said that they're going to underperform production tar targets. Mm -hmm. So we've had not only a country, uh, but we also have you know, CCJ, which is the largest miner. So um, I, it, it, to be honest, I think demand's going to still continue to outstrip mm, wow. supply. And you have to factor in, is the United States and other, other Western countries going to sanction uh, Russia, right? Because if they do, mm -hmm. on the uranium supply, that means they can't supply uranium and not... No, they aren't a big uranium producer, but they are big uranium processor. So um, a lot of uranium goes to their country, they process it and they sell, sell it you know, elsewhere. And so if the West decides to put some sort of sanctions on that product, that's going to reduce supply, at least to the West. Mm. Nice insights there. Wow. That's good to know. Thank you so much for that. And you are the trusted source for all of this. So love that information. Thank you, Tracy. Now, lithium. We know that Hertz uh, changed their tune and they plan to sell a third of the U.S. EV fleet that they had. That was a recent news. They're re reinvesting in ICE 
uh, gasoline powered cars. No one wants EVs. I have to say, no this, one wants EVs. Right? I your tweet that. today. I love your tweet. No one wants EVs. Your tweet. Aston Martin admits drivers don't want electric cars. This is your tweet today. Um, tell us about lithium. Is it still no, in demand? What, what's you know, on? lithium's still going to be in demand. Obviously, you know, you have China still is the world's largest EV producer. They produce a lot of electric vehicles. Now, they're not going to enter the U.S. market because of tariff problems and uh, other issues, um, but they are big in, in Europe, but Europe's trying to uh, put sort of tariffs on them as well. But, you know, I I mean, EV is still a growth market. I just don't think it's the biggest growth market. And what I think also is what we're seeing with lithium is that there's a move to switch kind of technology. So it's a different kind of lithium that you need to mine. And, I, and so I think, you know, we've seen we've seen a crash in prices over the since 2022, let's be honest, at the height of the lithium craze in the summer of 2022. Mm -hmm. um, there is, you know, I have to admit, there's a lot of supply. And I think battery technology is evolving. And so people don't want to buy as much because the, as this technology is improving and you need to buy a different source of lithium, how does that turn out? Then you also have weak demand from the West, even if China's, you know, a big part of that demand. And so I think this market's kind of up in the air right now. And so I can't really, I, I'm, I, I, I'm not really, I, I'm kind of agnostic on this market. Mm. Right this I like second. That. <laughs> I like that. It's good. <laughs> Thank you. How about gold and silver? What are your thoughts on that and the miners or junior miners over there? I think gold miners, gold junior miners are starting to look really interesting uh, because of gold price. I certainly wouldn't try to uh, trade outright gold price because mm -hmm. I think that it's, yeah. So <laughs> as you know, um, mm -hmm. silver, silver, I, th I have... You know, silver, what I love about silver, and it's, you know, also another manipulated market if you look at, uh, you know, just flat futures prices. I think you need to also look at miners at that point. What I like about silver is because it's not only considered like a, a precious metal, but it's also an industrial metal. And there's a lot of silver required for electrical components and vehicles. And when you're talking about, um, Vehicles, first of all, are getting more and more electrical. But if you're talking EVs, we're quadrupling the amount of electric components that you have in a nice vehicle. And that's just one example. You also need a lot of silver for uh, solar panels, and you also need a lot of silver for wind turbines. And so I really like this market. Do I think Flat price is going to do it for you. And do I think you should go straight futures markets? No way. It's too volatile. I think go find some miners that have some good projects going on. I think they will do really well. Well said. Thank you so much. Um, it's always about the risk adjusted returns. So you don't want to be in too much of a volatile uh, stock as well or futures like, oh. Uh, but ETFs are a great way to play all of these. And uh, I think that's, that's, yeah, exactly. Well said. Thank and you. if you're looking, I just want to, one more, I just want to, yeah, please, if, please. If, if you're talking about uh, if, uh, precious metals, whether that's uh, platinum or gold or mm -hmm. silver, if you're looking at ETFs, my only advice is find an ETF that's actually backed by the physical and make sure you're not just trading derivatives paper. Yes. All I have to say. <laughs> all right. Yes, that's that's it's so like important. Final word. <laughs> yes, there's um yeah that physical one that's uh, yeah there's quite a few of them. But yes, absolutely. Well said. Thank you so much. It's important to always. I always say go deep under the hood and take a look at what's in these portfolios and and what these ETFs actually hold. So um, there's like there was one that was really funny. It was an AI ETF, and they were like, oh, I'm gonna invest in the AI ETF. It's actually. Um, a portfolio that's created by an AI. It's not even about AI. It was like, <laughs> you need to go and look what these portfolios actually have. So yeah. it can be deceiving. The headlines can be deceiving. Um, so what about cocoa and cacao, whatever you want to call it, and coffee or fertilizers, agriculture, cattle? Are you into any of those? 
Um, you know, I think that, I mean, I think that the cocoa market, cocoa, whatever you want, however you want to pronounce it. Um, I think, you know, we started to see a pullback today. I think it's a little bit oversold. Do I want to jump in this market? No, not necessarily. Um, I think that, um, I think corn is interesting here. If I'm going to mm -hmm. look at any of the ags, because I don't really trade ags that often, but I think corn is interesting. I'm kind of willing to catch a knife here because the fertilizer markets are very tight right now. It's mm -hmm. going to be very expensive for farmers to plant corn with these prices. And again, as I mentioned before, low prices are here for low prices. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and this market, if you look at this market and how it's positioned, it's literally everybody's short this market. Nobody's long this market whatsoever. And so I think positioning wise, this market could be set up for a kind of a, sh a short squeeze, to, to be honest. And so um, I would say give it some time, look at September or December options. Um, but I think that could be an interesting trade. Opportunity. Wow. Thank you so much for that. Interesting. And uh, could you play that with corn, the actual corn? No, I would play in the options market. Ah, okay. Very nice. Now, um, equities. Um, I don't know if you trade with equities as well. Are you any thoughts you have with technology, AI, or just the overall market? What is your outlook and your feel for any of that? Your thoughts? I, I mean, I I don't trade the broader market, so to speak, as in uh, the indices. And so, um, you know, I think there's a little bit of a mania going on right now with AI. Yeah. Right? Um, but, you know, I, you know, I guess don't fight the trend right now. But again, I don't trade these markets. So I don't really probably have much constructive to say on that. On that, you know, um, I would just be careful of any sort of mania because it always reverts to the mean and I can only use uh, commodities as an example of that and that's happened many times over many different markets and we've seen this happen over and over again in um even in equities markets right right we had you know um you know the 2000 1999 2000 um tech crash right everybody was so it's not like markets haven't ever seen this mania before so just be careful take your profits Valuable very much and let's not like you know yeah just, just be careful <laughs> exactly i love that valuable insights and wisdom um i want to ask you about equities like uh, psx you know the refiners the oil refiners or canadian oil companies are there any that you're bullish on that you're looking at do you like that sector of the oil market i love refiners right now but not integrated refiners i went straight refiners so mm. you're like mpc psx BLO, like mpc yeah great Marathon. refiners yeah that do not that are not integrated so when i say mm. by integrated i mean your xom and your shell and your whatnot that you know uh, are producers as well as you know they have upstream midstream uh so i i think refiners will do extremely well because we're not building any more refining capacity in the United States. So I think U.S. refiners will continue to do well. We have, uh, as I think demand's going to increase still. And um, again, we, we just don't have any new greenfield projects. All our brownfield projects are built up. There's, not, there's nothing new in the pipeline. So <laughs> you're still going to need gas in your car. So I like that. Um, as far as uh, Canada is concerned, I'm a little bit apprehensive on Canada right now. I like, you know, I like some of the smaller producers, but I'm still, I'm waiting to see what the government does there, to be honest with you. Uh, because I, you know, so far it's been a hamper. I, I'm very positive on Canadian production, I am. But I want to see what the government is going to do to what regulations the government's going to put, the federal government's going to put in place and or can the provincial governments override the federal governments and 
you know, things will do well, particularly in obviously Alberta and Saskatchewan, where most of that production is coming from. Very smart. Very important to always see what the government's doing when investing in a country, um, stocks it's in a nice. country. <laughs> Very important. I know I was looking at IMO, Imperial Oil, and I had traded that in the past. And Suncor, I've uh, always popped up as some good ones in Canada. Do you have any thoughts about those? Just wondering. Yeah, but I, I mean, I've traded in a lot of Suncor before, CBE. I mean, there's there's so, there's a couple of good companies mm -hmm. there. But again, just be careful of the government regulations. Yes. Just a little bit apprehensive right now until these kind of provincial federal government fights have found some sort of resolution. Perfect. Wise words there. What about Bitcoin? Now we <laughs> see Bitcoin is pushing all time highs right now. We're in the sixties. Now Lesson. you're asking me way out of my, <laughs> just your <laughs> thoughts on it. We appreciate your no, wise insights. You know, you know, I mean, it's great to see Bitcoin go. I think, I think, I think, Bitcoin price, you know, going higher is not only just because of this, uh, these uh, e new ETFs. And you know, I I actually interviewed um, Eric from Bloomberg just the other oh, day. Oh, you have Baltunas? Yeah, yeah, he was okay. on here too. So, there you go. And so I, he's the most interesting person to talk Amazing. to about yeah. the Bitcoin ETF. And so I think he has more insights than, than I do, to be honest. <laughs> With ETFs, he knows more than anyone. <laughs> yeah. So I'll let him figure that. I, I think it's I think it's phenomenal. I also think that I will say I think that it's just beyond the actual the ETF um thing. You know, I think that says a lot about, you know, where people's heads are at right mm -hmm. this is why i think that even we we've seen gold still stable to higher with the stock market rising which is generally not what we see mm -hmm. so i think that says a lot about you know flight to safety whether you like whether you consider Bitcoin flight to safety or not, there's a lot of people that consider it flight to safety. Yes, for monetary debasement, it's like your hedge against that and monetary destruction. Exactly. And so, you know, and I, I think we see this same uh, thing in gold right now, you know, because I remember there was a big debate at one time, is it nobody's buying gold, so they're buying Bitcoin, but, but mm -hmm. I don't think it's either been in either or. I think that they're products of two... Yes. Two different things were going on in those markets at the same time, but now they're both rising together. So, you know. Right. And uh, everything's going up. Um, yeah, there seems to be a correlation between liquidity and Bitcoin. Uh, there's been some research on that. But I think that, you know, we saw the Fed injecting liquidity with the BTFP, and then we have the Treasury as well injecting liquidity. So there is liquidity, and, um, and it's apparent with the markets and Bitcoin and everything, you know. So, um, thank you so much for everything. You are amazing. And I urge everyone to follow you. You are super, super brilliant with all of these areas that, you know, are very difficult to follow and to know the truth and what's really going on. So um, thank you, Tracy, for this. Could you Thank you so much. Thank you. Please tell everyone how they can follow you and your website and where they can subscribe to, you know, your your yep. amazing writings so yes i'm at shy girl on twitter and um you can subscribe retail subscribers can just subscribe at dampspring.com and my website is hilltowerresourceadvisors.com awesome i'll be linking that all that in the description thank you so much tracy this has been absolutely amazing we've learned so much i'm definitely going to be checking out those refiners those junior miners and all the other things we talked about so thank you have a great day thank you